Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Choosing the Right Total Organic Carbon Analyzer for Pharmaceutical QC Laboratory Applications. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana, sets the standard for providing expert analytical solutions for healthcare diagnostics in the biopharmaceutical industry. Biopharmaceutical and healthcare businesses, as well as academic and government institutions worldwide, rely on Beckman Coulter Life Sciences to deliver the highest quality data, robust analyses, and innovative thinking. From classic to cutting edge, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences has proven experience and expertise on a wide range of technology platforms. Every associate at Beckman Coulter Life Sciences is dedicated to delivering total customer satisfaction. For more information, please visit www.beckmancoulter.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of our presentation. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation properly, please let us know and click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button, lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Tony Harrison, experienced in water system total organic carbon conductivity and ozone analysis and clean room monitoring systems, as well as particle characterization. Tony has spent the last 12 years in applied metrology for the pharmaceutical and healthcare manufacturing industries. Prior to that, he worked for companies providing process control automation solutions for manufacturing industry. Tony was joint editor on the ISPE Guide to Ozone Sanitation of Pharmaceutical Water Systems and was also chief editor of the PHSS Best Practice Guide for Clean Room Monitoring. Tony is a well-known international speaker and has provided educational seminars on TOC, liquid particle counting, ozone sanitation for water systems, and clean room monitoring in the UK, France, Italy, India, Malaysia, China, the USA, Scandinavia, Ireland, Hungary, Switzerland, Indonesia, Belgium, Greece, Switzerland, Turkey, Egypt, Denmark, and most recently in Scotland and Poland. I will now turn it over to Tony Harrison for his presentation. Hello, and welcome to this presentation on total organic carbon analysis for the pharmaceutical industry. My name is Tony Harrison. Thank you for the introduction there. Um, I am working in the area of compliance and applications for Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Today, my presentation will cover uh, a little bit about the regulations for total organic carbon in pharmaceutical water. I'll also talk about the typical measurement technologies which are used and employed by TOC analyzers used in the pharmaceutical water analysis quality control. And finally, I'll introduce to you a new technology, a new lab TOC analyzer technology which has been optimized for pharmaceutical quality control applications. So first, let's take a look at total organic carbon. Everything on our planet, if it's alive, it's carbon-based. So organic, anything organic contains carbon. So what we're measuring when we're talking about total organic carbon is the carbon in the organic molecule. It's not a specific test. Any organic molecule contains carbon, so this analyzer will be measuring simply the carbon atoms. If you have a large organic molecule with a lot of carbon, sorry, a lot of carbon atoms in it, then it will report a large amount of organic carbon. If you have a small, simple 
organic molecule with a small number of carbon atoms in there, and it will report a lower amount of organic carbon. So, for instance, on the screen here, I'm showing sucrose. Sucrose has 12 um, carbon atoms inside it, and what we're measuring is just those carbon atoms when we're talking about TOC. A TOC is an important quality characteristic in pharmaceutical water systems because the organic content of the water can provide a foodstuff on which microbes can thrive. And of course, the last thing we want in our pharmaceutical water systems is microbes. So controlling the level of organic carbon is incredibly important in our water systems. So let me just outline some definitions which will frame up the conversation today. In the water system, there's a total amount of carbon, TC. And that total amount of carbon is made up of a combination of inorganic carbon, such as dissolved carbon dioxide, and of course, organic carbon, TOC, which is what today's talk is about. So the total carbon is the sum of the inorganic carbon and the organic carbon combined together. Just to put this in context, let me explain about a parts per billion of TOC. So PPD normally is what we measure and report organic carbon in pharmaceutical water, and PTB is parts per billion. In a dissolved phase, so in a liquid, a PPD indicates weight or mass. In a gas phase, PPB is volume, but in dissolved phase, PPB is mass or weight. So one part per billion of total organic carbon in one liter of very pure water is in fact one microgram. So we're measuring very small trace amounts here. And measuring one microgram accurately in one liter of water, which weighs a kilo, that's like having a wristwatch, which is accurate to measuring one second in 32 years. So effectively, we're measuring almost trace amounts, almost zero, when we're measuring parts per billion of total organic carbon. Now, there are some changes happening in the European pharmacopoeia for pharmaceutical water. It's a slow process, but there are some changes coming. Currently, the text from the European Pharmacopoeia states that water for injection should be made from a distillation process. So it actually says water injection from distillation. So it's quite specific as to how water for injection is made. But of course, water is one of the largest raw materials used in the pharmaceutical and the biopharmaceutical industries. Thousands of gallons are used every day. So making water for injection from the distillation process is a very energy intensive and very costly process. So certainly here in Europe, companies like Novartis and Roche have been working with the European Pharmacopoeia to ask them if they could use a third type of water quality called highly purified water it actually has the same quality attributes as water for injection, but in fact it's made by, instead of a distillation process, it's made by a double pass reverse osmosis process. The microbial control for the water system is achieved through dissolving ozone into the water, and ozone gives a very high level of microbial control. So unique to the European pharmacopoeia is this third type of water, highly purified water. And the reason these companies like Novartis and Roche persuaded the regulators to allow this third type of water is because reverse osmosis is a, uses a greatly reduced amount of energy and therefore the cost to manufacture this quality of water is much lower. These companies also worked with the European Pharmacopoeia <clears throat> to demonstrate to them that the 
microbiological control of water systems, cold water, is better, in fact, or certainly equal to uh, heat sanitized water systems. As was mentioned a moment ago in the introduction, there is a guide available from the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineering, the ISPE, and it's a good practice guide for ozone sanitization of pharmaceutical water systems. This guide was created by an international group, including myself there, as you can see, I was one of the core team leaders, together with uh, one of the uh, senior uh, engineers on a, from the global team at Pfizer. But you can see contributors for this document also came from Novartis, Shearing Plow, when Shearing Plow existed, GlaxoSmithKline, and Sanofi. So we engage with all of these senior level uh, engineers from these different companies to combine and pool the knowledge to provide the best practice. And the reason we did that was to convince the regulators that the combination of double pass reverse osmosis and ozone for microbiological control gives an excellent quality of water, which in many cases is better than heat sanitized water for injection. So the European Pharmacopeia is going through a consultation process right now to consider the use of double pass RO, reverse osmosis, as an allowable technology for the manufacture of water for injection. So the European directorate who uh, owns the European Pharmacopeia here you can see they've got an expert workshop in, in practice at the moment, which is working on the use of reverse osmosis for water for injection. Now, one of the criteria that they attach to the use of double pass reverse osmosis is that the TOC limit for the water made, the water for injection manufactured using double pass RO should be lowered. So currently, the limit allowable in purified water and water for injection, however it's made, is 500 parts per billion of TOC. However, as I mentioned at the start of this talk, TOC is effectively an organic food for any microbes that might find themselves in the water system. So what the European Pharmacopeia is asking is that if they allow the use of that will pass reverse osmosis as a method for making water for injection, they're suggesting that in their document here, a significant reduction of the TOC level will be required because they are saying that's then a lot safer than a higher 500 ppb limit. If you lower that TOC limit, and if any microbes do manage to get into the water system, they've got no food to eat. So it's likely that we'll see in the future a lowering of that TOC limit for water for injection from 500 ppb to a lowering, lower level. This process is at very early stages at the moment, so I think we're a few years off, but potentially the expectations for water for injection in the European pharmacopoeia will lower in the future. Okay, so that's just some industry news for you, a heads up if you like. So let's take a look at common total organic carbon analyzer technologies. Now TOC measurement is used on many different types of water, right from industrial waste water, which can have thousands of parts per million of TOC in it, right down to water for injection and highly purified water. There's a mistake on this slide, by the way. It says highly purified water. I mean ultra-pure water there. On the right hand of the screen, that says highly purified. It should say ultra-pure. Now, ultra-pure is the water used in the semiconductor industry for manufacturing their wafers, semiconductor wafers. And you can see that the target level of TOC they look for in these semiconductor ultra-pure waters is less than 0 0.1 ppb. So these water qualities are extremely high used in the semiconductor industry, much purer than we use in the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry. So TOC analysis is used as a quality attribute measurement 
right across this range of water qualities. The industrial wastewater with its thousands of parts per million of TOC present is quite difficult to oxidize. There's a lot of organic material in that water, and to oxidize it, we need a very aggressive analysis. On the other hand, the uh, purified water, water for injection, and ultra-pure waters are very easy to oxidize. There's relatively low levels of organic material present, and the oxidization technology does not need to be as aggressive as it does for industrial wastewater. So it's quite common for TOC analyzers measuring TOC in industrial wastewater or river waters or effluent waters to use a very aggressive high temperature oven uh, combustion system which incinerates the water sample, sample at high temperatures uh, and then any organic carbon that's present in the water is turned into carbon dioxide and is measured using non-dispersive infrared. So that's a very aggressive oxidation technology. In this middle group of waters, including our purified water and water for injection for pharmaceutical use, there's two common technologies used in here. A combination of ultraviolet light and persulfate, which gives quite a wide range of analysis, and a differential conductivity using ultraviolet light. So these are very common technologies used in the lower TOC uh, waters. Typically, the high temperature oven TOC analyzers require a lot of maintenance. In some cases where the water is very dirty, uh, they can require maintenance on a weekly basis. Whereas down in the very pure waters, the purified water and water for injection, the simpler technology employed in these TOC analyzers for this type of water quality, typically much lower maintenance. So let's take a look at the technology for high temperature ovens. Typically, the organic carbon is drawn into an oven which may have a temperature in excess of 850 degrees centigrade. So it's very high temperature. The sample is uh, oxidized as it's incinerated. And any organic carbon that's present in that sample is turned into carbon dioxide gas. This gas is then measured using a, a non-dispersive infrared sensor. This sensor uses an infrared light, and infrared is absorbed by carbon dioxide. So the more carbon dioxide present, the lower the amount of infrared reaches the detector. So it's quite a, a simple measurement. Unfortunately, for pharmaceutical applications, this type of analysis has quite a, a large amount of measurement uncertainties. So for very low level TOC waters, it's not really suitable. And typically this type of technology has a, a limit of quantitation in the range of between 50 and 150 ppb. And of course, most modern pharmaceutical water systems using high technology for water treatment uh, are, are achieving TOC levels much lower than 50 ppb. So this high temperature oven is not really suitable for measuring purified water and water for injection, certainly not in the future when the European Pharmacopeia changes the rules and we have to get much lower than 500 ppb. In fact, I was speaking to a user of a high temperature oven uh, technology fairly recently in the pharmaceutical industry, and they reported back that after eight months of working with the TOC analyzer, the TOC analyzer failed the system suitability test, and they've never managed to get it to pass since. And those of you who are familiar with um, the requirements in the pharmacopoeias, system suitability testing is one of the required tests that you must pass for a TOC analyzer to be used for pharmaceutical quality water. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, TOC analysis is not a specific test. It measures anything organic, and it reports it in the same way. So it doesn't tell you what type of organic material you have in your water system. 
so that generally speaking, most of the pharmacopoeias across the world, with the exception of the Japanese pharmacopoeia, require you to do a system suitability test using a difficult to oxidize organic material and an easy to oxidize organic material. So typically the test is done with uh, a benzoquinone, which is considered relatively difficult to oxidize, and the sample of benzoquinone contains 500 parts per billion of carbon. And then also a test is run on the analyzer, it's challenged with sucrose containing equally 500 ppb of carbon. And the TOC analyzer must analyze these difficult to oxidize and easy to oxidize samples and give results within plus or minus 15%. Uh, and this is defined by the pharmacopoeia. Now the issue, as I mentioned, with the high temperature oven TOC analyzers is at these very low levels, around 500 ppb or less, the results can vary quite a lot. They're really designed for measuring hundreds of thousands of ppm. So down here in the ppb levels, the measurement uncertainties don't give a very good reproducibility of results. So here you can see on the left, we're testing sucrose and benzoquinone, and the results vary quite a lot. So the average from the sucrose <coughs> there from these measurements is around 408 ppb. The three measurements from the benzoquinone is around 544 ppb. So the ability of the analyzer to accurately report is the issue here. It's perfectly capable of oxidizing both of these materials, but the measurement inaccuracies mean that in this particular case, the difference between the reported results was 33%. So in this case, the TOC analyzer, although it's perfectly capable of analyzing a wide range of TOC, uh, sorry, organic material, in this case, it failed the system suitability test. So high temperature oven is not really a, a good technology for us to use in our pharmaceutical water analysis. So very good for uh, very dirty waters, wastewater, etc., but not so good for pharmaceutical water. So let's take a look at another technology here, a, a dual cell differential conductivity TOC analyzer. Here's a couple of examples of uh, dual cell TOC analyzers. The one on the right is using UV light as the oxidizer combined with um, an oxidizing chemical, a sulfate, and an acid. And this combination of these chemicals and the UV light gives it quite a wide range of TOC analysis. The one on the left is designed to sit online on a, a, a pharmaceutical purified water or water for injection loop where we know that the TOC levels are going to be a lot lower. So it doesn't use the um, chemicals, it just uses a UV light which is perfectly adequate for this application. Both of these analyzers rely on the fact that when carbon dioxide is dissolved into water, it makes a very weak acid, carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid can contribute to the conductivity of the water. So by measuring the conductivity and oxidizing the organics to carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide then dissolves in the water and raises the conductivity. So measuring differential conductivity allows us to measure uh, the carbon dioxide from the oxidized organics. So let's have a look how these technologies work. This one here, it doesn't have the reagent, the oxidizing reagent, or the acid. So this is the online version. At the top, the water flows into a small reservoir and then continuously goes to drain. And at the bottom of the picture here, you can see a pump. So this pump draws a sample at a continuous flow rate from the reservoir at the top. By working in this way, the TOC analyzer is able to control the flow rate of the water through the analyzer. And this is very important because the water will now flow through the analyzer and take two separate paths. On the left, it passes past a 
ultraviolet light. And that ultraviolet light oxidizes the organic material as it goes past. So controlling the flow rate is very important because we want consistent exposure to the UV lamp. And that's why it uses a pump to draw the water from the reservoir at the top. You can see there are two flow paths through this analyzer. On the right, there's a delay coil, which means that the water on the left passing by the UV lamp and the water on the right without a UV lamp but with a delay coil, both of those waters reach the analysis cells at the same time. So what we have here is two analysis cells. There's a membrane separating these analysis cells from the water system. And this, war, this membrane is permeable for carbon dioxide only. So these membranes keep any interfering substances which may be present in the water away from the measurement cells. So the carbon dioxide from the organic and the inorganic passes through and is measured by temperature compensated conductivity cells, two separate measurements. Now, it can be, and, and some of you using this technology may have seen this, but it can be that the TOC calculated by these measurements it suffers from interferences from inorganic carbon in the water. So on the right here, there's no UV lamp. So what we're measuring is carbon dioxide from any inorganic carbon, like carbon dioxide dissolved in the water on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, we measure inorganic carbon. On the left-hand side, we've got that inorganic carbon already in the water, and we've also used the UV lamp to oxidize any organic carbon to carbon dioxide. So on the left-hand side, we have the inorganic and the organic carbon. So we're actually measuring total carbon on the left-hand side and total inorganic carbon on the right-hand side. And the analyzer uses these two measurements to calculate the level of TOC present in the water. Now, the issue with pharmaceutical-grade waters is typically the starting point for these is reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis tends to remove most of the contaminants from the water, but carbon dioxide will pass straight through the reverse osmosis system. And so you tend to find that carbon dioxide present in the water is concentrated when it passes into the purified water. So the relative levels of carbon dioxide forming the inorganic carbon is quite high typically on a pharmaceutical water system when compared to the levels of organic carbon. So if we're measuring inorganic and total and calculating TOC, it can give some uh, challenges for the, for the measurement. As I mentioned, total organic carbon, to TC, is the sum of inorganic and organic carbon. So if you measure total carbon, and you measure total inorganic carbon, you can make a calculation to estimate the amount of TOC in the water system. Now, I'm going to work through a brief example here to explain some of the challenges you might face using this technology. So we're going to calculate the TOC. We're measuring the total carbon, which in this example is 2,000 ppb. And most of that total carbon, as I mentioned, is made up of the carbon dioxide concentrated into the water through the reverse osmosis process. So 1,900 ppb of that total carbon is made up of inorganic carbon, dissolved carbon dioxide. <coughs> so the actual level of total organic carbon is only 100 ppb. Now, as I mentioned on the right, we're measuring inorganic carbon. On the left, we're measuring total carbon, and we're making a, a calculation to estimate TOC. Now, this technology has um, a relatively low measurement errors, but if we sum them all up, like variations in the flow rate, variations in the UV intensity over time, variations in the permeability of those membranes, which are allowing the carbon dioxide gas to go through to the measurement cells. 
and also slight drift in those temperature compensated conductivity cells. All of these measurement errors typically add up to a measurement error of plus or minus 2% for those two measurement cells. Now, it doesn't sound very much. Plus or minus 2% sounds quite reasonably accurate. But, as I mentioned, we're calculating TOC here. We're measuring the total carbon, and we're measuring total inorganic carbon, and we're making the calculation. So, back to our example where we have total carbon of around 2,000 ppb, most of which is inorganic carbon, 1,900 ppb. So we're looking to measure and report around 100 ppb for the TOC. However, as I've just said, the measurement sensors uh, have a, an accuracy of plus or minus 2%. So the t totally inorganic carbon can measure uh, with the plus or minus 2% anywhere between 1,862 ppb to 1,968 ppb. And similarly, the total carbon with its plus or minus 2% can measure anywhere between 1,960 to 2,040 ppb. So if you do the maths, you can see that the calculated and reported TOC can be anywhere in the range from between 22 ppb to 178 ppb. So here you can see one of the main challenges uh, for using this technology for measuring pharmaceutical quality waters in the sense that it's not doing a direct measurement. It's doing a, a measurement of inorganic and total carbon, and it's actually making a calculation. Now, for any of you which have used this technology in your quality control laboratory for measuring pharmaceutical waters, may have occasionally seen this technology reporting negative TOC readings. And the reason for that is that there's a slight drift between those two measurement cells. As they drift over time between the two of them, that drift applies an offset to the measurement. So over time, the measurement can actually have an offset, which forces it to reproduce and report a negative TOC. So particularly for very, very pure waters, with low levels of TOC, low levels of organic carbon, this technology can periodically report negative TOC. And the reason for that is because it's a calculated TOC measurement. This is a, another example uh, of a, 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 a dual conductivity sensor TOC analyzer. In this case, it's a flow-through analyzer, so there's a conductivity sensor on the left and there's a conductivity sensor on the right. The water flows from left to right. The initial conductivity sensor is measuring the carbon dioxide from the um, inorganic carbon. There's a UV lamp in the middle here, and the, at the end, we're measuring the total carbon from the oxidized carbon and the inorganic carbon. So this does the same thing as the other technology. It measures total carbon and total inorganic carbon, and it does a calculation. The other thing to bear in mind with this technology is the flow path through the analyzer is quite short. It's about three minutes total time. So the, uh, it's unlikely that higher levels of TOC will be completely oxidized in that time, not enough time for the UV lamp to do complete oxidation. Now, the pharmacopoeia, the European pharmacopoeia, in the chapter on TOC analysis, it mentions the objective of these TOC analyzers is to completely oxidize the organic molecules to carbon dioxide. And the reason it makes this requirement is because as the um, organic molecules are oxidized down to carbon dioxide, as the bonds are being broken down, Quite often, the intermediate species, before it fully goes to carbon dioxide, can be organic acids. And these organic acids can contribute quite strongly to the conductivity. So you get a conductivity profile, like I'm showing on the screen here, where the intermediate acids actually give a higher conductivity than the final weak acid, the carbonic acid, from the carbon dioxide. So with a longer chain molecule, quite often you get these intermediate species 
uh, which give a higher conductivity. So a complete TOC uh, um, oxidation to carbon dioxide is very important. So particularly here, you can see a, a small a chain molecule, methanol. Um, here, it goes straight, almost straight to carbon dioxide. So the oxidation profile is very different. So why is that important? Well, typically, most people calibrate TOC analyzers um, using 500 parts per billion carbon contained in sucrose. It's a very simple um, calibration standard to make. So sucrose containing 500 ppb of carbon. So if we put that through this TOC analyzer here, as I mentioned, the three-minute flow path, as it goes past the UV lamp, it's partially oxidized. And then it measures the car conductivity. So we've just told this analyzer we're putting through 500 ppb of carbon. So it measures the conductivity and it says, okay, I now know 3.4 is equal to 500 parts per billion on the conductivity scale of carbon. Now, if the C's are simpler to oxidize organic, still containing the same amount of organic carbon, 500 ppb, in this particular case, that three-minute flow path is fine. Complete oxidization occurs, no problem at all. And now, however, the conductivity it's measuring for that 500 ppb of carbon is much lower. So it reports a much lower level of organic carbon where, in fact, it's the same amount present. This is a paper published on, available for download from the internet by a company called GE Sievers, and they were challenging different types of measurement technology for TOC with different types of organic material. And you can see here in this excerpt from this that they applied 500 parts per billion of carbon in sucrose to these different models uh, manufacturers of TOC analyzer. They've all been calibrated with sucrose containing 500 ppb of carbon. So not surprisingly, they all report fairly good uh, results and comparable results when challenged with sucrose containing 500 ppb of carbon. However, if you apply 500 ppb of carbon in a very simple to oxidize substance like methanol, you can see here where that that TOC analyzer using the three-minute flow path will under-report because it sees less conductivity than it did with the sucrose, and so it reports a lower level of TOC. So I'd like to introduce to you now a new laboratory TOC analyzer technology. So we've looked at high-temperature oven. We've looked at differential conductivity. This analysis method uses a combination of ultraviolet light and persulfate. The persulfate is a, um, an oxidizing reagent, and it measures the final oxidized carbon dioxide as a gas using a non-dispersive infrared sensor. This analyzer is actually manufactured by the makers of the Anatel online TOC analyzers who've been making these online TOC analyzers for over 20 years. So when designing this TOC analyzer, um, the rules we were looking for was that it should be a direct TOC measurement. We didn't want any calculated TOC here because of the reasons we mentioned, particularly in the light that the European pharmacopoeia may reduce the target level for, for TOC in the organic, uh, sorry, in the water, purified and water for injection to lower than 500 ppb. So we didn't want to make any calculated TOC estimates here. We wanted a direct measurement of TOC. Typically, these TOC analyzers are very busy in the quality control laboratory, so we designed it to help improve productivity. Uh, most users of TOC analyzers in the quality control laboratory, take four samples and discard the first sample. And the reason is that they know full well that first sample will contain some carryover from the previous vial. So with this design, we've designed it so it eliminates pretty much carryover from vial to vial and allows you to take a much lower number of samples 
to get your TOC results. And the last thing we've done here is we've, we've, we're conscious that the pharmaceutical industry is um, going through a, a challenging time and are seeking to reduce the costs of ownership. So we've reduced the service costs for this TOC analyzer. It's a very simple device, and it only needs an annual service uh, versus a more typical six monthly service requirement for most other technologies. So let me explain how it does the direct TOC measurement. The analysis, as I mentioned, it uses a UV lamp and a reagent. It uses an oxidizing reagent and, a, and an acid as well. And there's a carrier gas here. And all of these are put into the sample analysis cell here, the UV reactor. The inorganic carbon and the organic carbon are independently turned into carbon dioxide and removed. There's a Peltier core to remove any moisture. And then it passes through a non-dispersive infrared detector. And then finally goes through a catalytic ozone destructor because UV lights generate ozone. So there's a, a catalytic destructor there to remove the ozone. The first step in the analysis is to remove the inorganic carbon from the sample. So we add an acid to the water sample we've just taken into the analysis chamber. And this acid shifts the pH of the water to less than pH 2. So it's quite acidified. And in this acidified state, the carbon dioxide tends to come out of solution, um, out of carbonic acid. It moves out into carbon dioxide gas. And then what we do is we use the carrier gas, which is typically a pure nitrogen gas, to bubble through the sample and to push the carbon dioxide out of the sample and into the infrared detector. So the infrared detector measures the carbon dioxide from the inorganic. And you can see from the graph here, we wait until the, all of the carbon dioxide is removed, all of the inorganic is removed, before we start the oxidization process for the organic carbon. So we take the sample into the UV reactor where the analysis takes place. We add the acid. The acid pushes um, the carbon, the inorganic carbon out of solution as a carbon dioxide gas. And then we use the sparging gas, the nitrogen gas, to push that carbon dioxide out from the water sample and into the infrared detector. The infrared detector measures the carbon dioxide and it waits till it sees that all of the carbon dioxide from the inorganic is removed before it reports to the analyzer it's safe to go ahead and measure the TOC. So we completely remove the TIC from the sample and we wait before the detector tells us all of the carbon dioxide is removed before we turn the UV lamp on and start the oxidization of the organic carbon. So the direct measurements of TOC uh, is done with two processes. First of all, we turn the UV lamp on. The UV lamp um, acts on the water molecules, the H2O, and turns them into OH plus radicals, which are quite strong oxidizers. So they begin to work on the organic bonds. At the same time, the UV lamp activates the persulfate. So now the persulfate molecules are also strong oxidizers. So the combination of the UV lamp and the activated persulfate has a very strong oxidation on, on the organic materials. So now we're going to measure carbon dioxide. Now we're going to measure the carbon dioxide directly from the TOC. So in this particular case, we turn the UV lamp on. Once we've made sure all of the inorganic material is removed, we turn the UV lamp on. And now the UV light combined with the, the sulfate is starting to oxidize the organic material to carbon dioxide. So then we use the carrier gas to push the carbon dioxide from the TOC back out and into the infrared detector here. And now we can measure directly the carbon dioxide just from the TOC. 
So as I mentioned, we wait until the, the, the carbon dioxide from the inorganic is completely removed before we turn the UV lamp on and do a direct measurement of the carbon dioxide from the TOC. As I mentioned, we've tried to improve the productivity of the way these analyzers worked. Many users of TOC analyzers uh, were complaining that they had to take four samples from each vial and discard the first sample to avoid carryover from the previous vial. So you can see here on the left, this would be ideal, where vial A, the two samples from vial A, does not cross over into the two samples from vial B. But more typically, the picture on the right here is the more typical picture, where the first sample analyzed from vial B is in fact a combination of the carbon from the previous vial, vial A, and the new vial, vial B. And this is quite common. And for this reason, typically people do four analyses and ignore the first one to get past this sample to sample carryover. So what we've done with this analyzer is a very simple process. There's three steps. First of all, between vials, we back flush the sample line using the reagent in the analyzer itself. So the sample line is back flushed and that is taken to drain. The second step we make is a forward flush. So we take a small amount of the water from the next vial and we flush that through the analyzer and again, it goes to drain. And the final step we take is a third sample. Now this one is the sample taken for analysis. So we've reduced the number of samples you need to take. Typically the carryover from sample to sample using this technique is reduced to less than 0.2% carryover. So we can take just three samples to get the analysis instead of four. And of course, if we're taking one less sample instead of the four samples, we can improve productivity by up to 25%. The other feedback we got was that some of the other technologies used for TOC analysis using reagents or carrier gas, they don't measure the reagent or the carrier gas. And if this runs out halfway through a tray of samples, the analyzer just carries on doing the analysis regardless and reporting incorrect results. With the um, end result that the user has to repeat the entire tray of samples again, and typically a tray of samples in a TOC analyzer with say 64 samples, it can take up to 20 hours to do. So it takes a whole day to do the tests again. So what we've done with this new design is we've reduced the servicing costs, we spread it out to a 12 monthly service interval. And the way we do that is by having a very simple design where it monitors every critical parameter in the analysis. So it monitors the carrier gas, the UV lamp intensity is measured, the flow rate of the sample, the non-dispersive infrared detector, the pump, and the reagents are all measured and monitored. So if at any point during the analysis, any of those critical parameters goes wrong, instantly the analyzer stops doing the analysis and puts a warning sign on the screen. So you're not wasting that entire tray full of, of water samples and getting incorrect results. So I've finished my presentation today. Uh, I believe there may have been some questions. So um, any questions? Yes, thank you, Tony, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit their questions. They can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can. We do have one question already. Does calibration or adjustment for metrology nomenclature not account for any instrument drift on any analytical instrument? Okay, so that's, that's a, a tricky question to answer because it's, a, it's actually a trick question. Uh, calibration according to the ISO standards is in fact a comparison of the measurement of the analyzer against a certified standard. So it's just a check to make sure that the analyzer is in fact uh, measuring correctly. Now, 
a common misinterpretation of calibration is in fact calibration adjustment, where we challenge the analyzer with multiple certified standards, calibration standards. The analyzer then adjusts its measurement to make sure that it is reporting correctly. So if you did that, if you did a periodic uh, adjustment of the calibration to make sure that the TOC analyzer is reporting correctly, then that would indeed get around the problem of those two sensors measuring independently. So a more frequent calibration adjustment gets around that problem with the two sensors in the uh, dual conductivity sensor TOC analyzer. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, exactly correct. The only downside for that, of course, is you're having to do a more frequent calibration of the analyzer, and this can be quite time consuming. So thank you for that question. Thank you. We do have another one. RO typically has high IC, as you have explained. The reagent list instrument is, oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading the wrong question. I apologize. For the QBD 1200, purging the sample that is not measuring NPOC, what happens to any volatiles? Are they lost? If yes, then NPOC is not equal to TOC, correct? Yes, for sure. It's, it's very unusual, really, to have purgeable organics in pharmaceutical grade water systems. They're more commonly found in drinking waters uh, and water, river waters and things like that. Typically, it's very low levels of uh, purgeable organics are found in pharmaceutical quality waters. So, it's not really uh, relevant to the measurements we're talking about here. Um, but yes, uh, it's quite correct. If there was um, purgeable organic carbon in the sample, then um, that would be lost um, by the process that the QBD used. So if you were using it, for instance, to measure drinking water and wastewater applications, then the purgeable organic elements of the TOC would be lost using this type of technology. And as I mentioned, this one is specifically designed for use or optimized for use, should I say, in the pharmaceutical quality waters where purgeable organic carbon is typically almost non-existent. So it's, it's not an issue for this particular application, but you're quite correct. If you had a, a dirty water sample with lots of purgeable organic carbon in it, then this technology would not measure the total organic carbon uh, very accurately. But for pharmaceutical water qualities, it's, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you we do have another question. question. Our audience member asks, we have been using QBD 1200 analyzer for manual single sample measurements. Samples are measured in triplicates. However, the first measurement had to be discarded because it was below the known parts per billion of the prepared 100 parts per billion standard. Is that normal? Okay. So, yes, you can use the QBD 1200 for taking manual samples from a beaker uh, instead of with the auto sampler. Uh, the downside of doing it that way is that you lose the sample-to-sample -sample carryover uh, elimination technique of this back flushing and forward flushing that I've described. That process only works um, with uh, the auto sampler. So if you're using it to, to, it's not really designed for that, but you can use it to take a manual grab sample from a beaker, uh, and you, you lose that sample-to-sample -sample carryover elimination. So. Unfortunately, it's likely that the first sample you take will not have as accurate TOC in it as it would do as if you were using the auto sampler. So thank you for that question. Great, and we do have another one. How long in minutes does the QBD take to process the three replicates described in the presentation? Yes, that's a good question. And as I was at pains to point out in the presentation here, the length of analysis depends entirely on the amount of inorganic and organic carbon that's present in the sample because the analyzer firstly waits until all of the carbon dioxide from the inorganic carbon is removed. And of course, if there's a large amount of inorganic carbon, that will take longer 
than if there's a small amount. And the same for the TOC analysis. A TOC analysis, um, again, the time it takes will vary according to the amount of organic carbon in the water sample. But what we found is that this TOC analyzer is uh, typically um, will anal analyze the three samples in anywhere on pharmaceutical quality waters between six and ten minutes. And comparing that to other technologies that I've described here, quite often they take a, a longer time than that uh, to do this analysis. So, thank you for that question. Thank you. We have another question. How does the QBD1200 behave with methanol compared to glucose? Okay. So because we're making the direct TOC measurement here, uh, we're actually measuring the carbon dioxide from the carbon atoms as they're oxidized in, in the organic. The type of, of um, whether it's a complex chain, or sorry, more complex chain like the sucrose or the methanol is a more simple chain, that doesn't really interfere with the signal at all because we oxidize the carbon to carbon dioxide and we measure it as a carbon dioxide gas. So we're not using conductivity here, uh, which is the problem I described earlier, where we are used, if we use dual conductivity sensors to measure the change in conductivity from the organic carbon as it's oxidized in the water, then the fact that the sucrose is more, uh, takes a longer time to oxidize can actually interfere with the results you've got there. So uh, an analyzer calibrated with sucrose using dual conductivity cells would re report 500 ppb of carbon in methanol as a much lower level. But with the QBD 1200, because we are oxidizing the, the um, organic carbon to carbon dioxide gas and not using differential conductivity, then it, it doesn't have any impact on the, the QBD 1200. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Tony. I see we have no more questions, so I would once again like to thank our presenter, Tony Harrison, for his participation in today's webcast. And do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, no, just to thank everybody for taking the time to, to listen to me today. I hope it's been informative and uh, useful presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Dana, for um, Sorry, Brenda, for having uh, uh, introduced me today. Thank you. You're very welcome. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Beckman Culture Life Sciences, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April of 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoot alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all we have for today. See you next time.